Okay, good morning to all of you who are online and who are here uh, offline or in the class. Today, in the morning, we will consider uh, two mandatory, how we call them, practical skills. One which uh, speaks about uh, the meaning of the feminist approach, uh, approach from gender equality perspective generally speaking and especially in political and legal thought and especially uh, in legal higher education and higher education in general and also I will mention uh, the, uh, some uh, guidelines for uh, uh, applying this feminist approach in uh, the parliaments in lawmaking and uh, control of their quality uh, about uh, feminist approach in judiciary, you had already heard a lot yesterday and also during the second practical skills workshop uh, there will be even more talk about uh, reconsidering of the case law from feminist perspective from feminist perspective or from gender equality perspective. Uh, so, uh, I would like to hear from you, how do you understand this, we can name that gender perspective or gender equality perspective or feminist perspective. Somebody who does not like the notion feminist can skip it, but, uh, but the, the same uh, meaning is on agenda. Also, we speak about gender lens or gender lenses. So I would like to hear from you uh, what are your, uh, your uh, ideas or developed opinion about uh, gender lens or uh, gender equality perspective. Generally, from your uh, background knowledge and your education and uh, knowledge as such, and also due to uh, all ideas you, uh, which you had uh, an opportunity to hear during the last uh, few days. So how do you understand gender perspective or feminist perspective in understanding uh, reality and also uh, concerning the relevant ideas for knowledge production or knowledge re revi revisioning production. So how do you understand gender lenses or gender equality approach, Nemanja? Uh, you can uh, tell your names because I didn't have a time to remember all, I apologize in advance, but Nemanja, Nemanja I know him, Sreten also, but f some I know, but the others not, not, not. please. So we, we put them on our eyes to stop being blind for uh, uh, injustice of sexes and uh, to stop being uh, ignorant about some uh, hidden, subtle, uh, manipul manipulative uh, moments when uh, we, at first we think everything is, is fine, everything is all right, but actually it isn't. Okay, so the others. If you if you want to reconsider your your uh, up to nowadays uh, legal education from gender perspective with the gender lens uh, used, what would it mean? You remember from the first introductory lecture that I was speaking about uh, how. Uh, the postmodern feminism, uh, then critical legal studies, critical race uh, studies, and critical race feminism uh, pushed forward uh, reconsidering of uh, the universalist uh, categories from the mainstream political and legal theories in 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 a, in a sense of uh, making attempts to deconstruct them, to 
show how uh, essentially they do not, they should not be considered as universally valid, but as categories constructed firstly uh, within the Western uh, legacy of knowledge production, so that it is Western centric, meaning that uh, pledging to be uh, universally valid means uh, applying the knowledge created in one context as universally valid, which, which it cannot be, because experiences of other races, uh, people of other cars, uh, uh, colors of uh, different cl classes, different cultures, religions, also have to be taken into consideration. Then also I spoke about uh, the relevance that uh, the existent uh, dichotomy in legal and political education, in lead, uh, legal and political scholarship, uh, be, uh, we take in as gr granted dichotomy between private and public sphere has to be overcome, etc., etc. Then I also spoke about that uh, this revised uh, no knowledge production in political and legal uh, scholarship and uh, uh, introducing gender lens or lenses into uh, making that gender sensitive and gender competent means uh, also attempts to, war to uh, again, uh, uh, under the influence of uh, post-modern uh, critical feminist uh, legal and political thought, uh, uh, attempts towards uh, overcoming, again, one dichotomy taken as granted, dichotomy uh, uh, based on binary female-male uh, relations. From time to time, we also uh, here during our lectures have been too much focused on that framework, however, uh, it is very important to be aware of uh, an importance and necessity to overcome this uh, heteronormative framework of analysis and uh, uh, attempt towards making the theory, the conceivements, understanding of reality, political, legal reality, uh, also from the perspective of uh, many vulnerable groups, including those uh, which are non-binary, so transgender uh, individuals and groups, etc., etc. But now uh, let us come back to the notions. Please be more active. Just Larissa, just a second. So you can add something about feminist perspective, but within this uh, consideration the notion gender awareness or gender equality awareness, we make it shorter very often, but we, I suppose that we know what we are talking about. I mentioned, <coughs> I mentioned gender sensitive approach, gender competent approach. What does it mean? And is there any difference between gender sensitive and gender competent? Maybe yes, maybe not. Sometimes they can be used synonymously. But, for example, I would uh, be for a little bit making a little bit differentiation. Larissa, thank you. I would uh, just like to add that I was thinking about this. What are fe what do we consider under the notion of feminist perspectives in legislation or in public law, public policies, or whatever? So or, edu edu or education, education or knowledge or production. Any kind of um, science or whatever, because we tend to introduce gender approach to all fields, not only uh, humanities, social sciences, law, politics, but also to STEM sciences. So basically, we're talking about feminist perspectives overall. So it has to start from the notion that all humans are raised in, into specific roles that are socially constructed and discursively productive. So that is the basic notion. We also uh, have a work on uh, discarding what you said already, universalist approaches, homogenic narratives, and master, grandmaster narratives, whether they are historical, 
uh, political narratives or whatever. So this kind of, uh, it is the general notion of feminist perspective and also to work on um, unconscious biases, which we all have. We all uh, uh, approach anything from the perspective where we were born and raised and uh, patriarchy is internalized. So this is part of this gender awareness raising where we uncover these layers, which are embedded also in each one of us. Thank you. So, as you said, gender uh, aware, awareness raising uh, could have or should have and has had the target uh, at indi within individual, then within education, within, within all spheres of knowledge production and policy making. So, gender, uh, gender uh, sensitive mindsets uh, developing is very very deeply connected with the gender mainstreaming and we will later a little bit more again uh, mention gender mainstreaming but as a matter of fact maybe we do not need that it's very important that uh, simply to sum up uh, that this gender awareness raising is crucial for uh, all all aspects and dimensions of gender mainstreaming. Gender mainstreaming, you can say if you want. So introducing gender equality perspective within human rights discourse, uh, putting human rights uh, into the center of uh, reality uh, design, uh, also in uh, into the center of knowledge production, not only in legal scholarship, but generally, and within that also uh, gender equality uh, as, 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 as the focus. So uh, equalizing of human rights from uh, gender perspective, meaning not only, again, male, female, but al also uh, transgender people. Uh, why this gender awareness raising, gender mainstreaming, uh, introducing gender approach into reality and into uh, uh, our minds, our mindsets? Mindset is also a very important uh, notion. Mindset means a uh, well-articulated approach to any sphere of social uh, reality uh, and mindset uh, more concretely means uh, the character, the quality of uh, articulation of the discourse, of methodological approach, of uh, the main categories of thought in a certain direction and gender awareness mindset or gender lens mindset, we know, we know uh, definitely what it means. But the, wh why all these notions always again do contain the activist approach? So it, it never is just putting on the table new categories and information about how and what uh, gender lens or gender perspective, gender mindset would mean. Why this activist uh, changing uh, the world, changing the mindsets, changing uh, the knowledge production, changing the policy making approach or law making approach. Why always this activist dimension is necessary? Nemanja? Well, it is necessary because uh, this new gender approach is uh, uh, objectively uh, looking at it uh, revolutionary. Meaning, uh, if uh, and undermined, and if we want to uh, affirm that, uh, sorry. Uh, meaning, uh, if uh, we just uh, sh show uh, show our uh, uh, learning and statistics and everything, but uh, we do nothing about it to change something in reality, people uh, people will will stay uh, status quo. Uh, they will uh, keep uh, keep uh, acting uh, like conservatives, and uh, nothing will change. 
good and nobody said anything about gender sensitive and gender competent for example i will mention later these books which uh, we published within the project but we call this gender competent legal education why didn't we uh, name that gender sensitive we could it would not be wrong but what is maybe you can guess what the difference could be so Jen, uh, larissa well it's more uh how should they say, specialized approach from the knowledgeable people who are actively investigating and working on these topics. So it's kind of specialist uh, thinking and overview. So that is basically gender competent. It means, yeah. And awareness is uh, lay people. All people should be aware. But gender competent people conduct these uh, workshops, give lectures, uh, produce discourses or knowledge basis that will be further on uh, disseminated. Great. Nemanja? Uh, it, I guess it's about how which one sounds. Uh, like uh, gender competent uh, people I see as some uh, subjects in a uh, legal uh, matter and uh, gender sens sensitive like some uh, objects who will have some rights that uh, we can uh, help them achieve, achieve their rights. It's, I mean, that sounds like that. Uh, Larissa was right to the point, and you, I think that, that you a bit missed that, but thank you for uh, an attempt. Uh, very simply to, to, or to simplify, so gender sensitive, all of us could be and should be. And it really is, so, uh, orientation of our mindsets and of our actions uh, towards uh, improving, advancing gender equality. The same is with those who uh, work in a gender competent way, but in this uh, uh, another uh, context, we speak about something additional, uh, a matter of competence, a matter of uh, scientific, uh, persuasive, based on uh, articulated arg argumentation, based on empirical surveys, which then uh, are in a gender sensitive way uh, understood and interpreted. So all of that uh, is entailed in this step forward or above uh, understanding. So gender competent uh, approach for example, some judges can react in a gender sensitive way in some case, uh, just spontaneously react in, in, in a good way from our perspective, from, uh, from the perspective of gender lens. But if they have already uh, developed articulated approach from gender equality perspective within human rights uh, orientation of their judging, then that's a little bit, but very important uh, difference. Uh, why a boosting of the process of gender equality is necessary? I, just to mention this uh, report, uh, Global Gender Gap Report of the uh, World Economic Forum from July uh, 2022. There, in that report, is said at the current rate of progress, it will take 132 years to reach full parity. So, uh, it means, at least from our attempts, that boosting, uh, pushing forward uh, attempts towards uh, gender ma mainstreaming is, is important. Do you agree, or you think that uh, just spontaneous letting things uh, happen and be done should be uh, an option, alternative. Sretan? Uh, yeah, I agree with boosting because uh, patriarchy is so strong even in the most developed and progressive countries in the world, so we need to an active approach to combat all that patriarchal um, remnants uh, even there and in, of course in the left of countries. And what is 
and what is the interconnection of this boosting and gender and the notion of gender mainstreaming? It's a, it's a methodological approach to increase the boosting. We use gender mainstreaming in a way to promote um, all the policies uh, and uh, throughout, the, throughout the social structure to um, combat the patriarchy. So boosting excellent, boosting through policies applied in education, uh, upbringing, etc., uh, etc. Et Nemanja? Yeah, so mainstreaming is one way of boosting, and also there are other ways of boosting, like uh, uh, more and more educational uh, 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 workshops, seminars, seminars, yes. So just one conferences way of boosting, and there are many. Excellent. Okay, so. Uh, Normatively speaking, evidently, at least uh, from this point of view, uh, boosting, uh, promoting, pushing forwards, uh, overcoming of uh, gender imperity is important. And challenges, challenges. Later I will speak more. Maybe I should have started from dialectic of patriarchy and emancipation, but that it will come together. Uh, very fast. So, what are the challenges uh, regarding this boosting processes and gender mainstreaming and uh, overcoming gender inequalities? Can you mention some challenges? Nemanja? Well, is, there is always a, a reaction of masses uh, in question, meaning uh, how would they, uh, how would they uh, react or feel? Uh, would they uh, at first accept or deny or uh, create a counter-revolutionary uh, rev wave? Or uh, maybe, maybe just uh, talk, talk bad, uh, talk bad about uh, gender equality and etc. The others, Mina, ah, Mina. Okay, so always when you talk about the causes and the challenges, it seems to me that it's always necessary to once more emphasize the role that stereotypes and prejudice play and the so deeply rooted patterns in society that we are often not aware of. So when we start with the boosting process and generally putting more emphasis on gender equality, it seems to me that the generally society encounters that there are certain biases and patterns that we are not even aware of. So that is always a starting point, it seems to me, when talking about any change and any step forward in terms of gender equality. Okay, uh, so first what we have to be, first what we have to be aware of is that the history of gender equality uh, promotion, the history of emancipation from gender perspective uh, has been a rather short history. We will speak a little bit later about that. So already achieved uh, women's rights and some of uh, non-binary people uh, ha have been by definition due to this short history uh, vulnerable. And there are uh, always again uh, trends uh, towards uh, deny, denying or uh, limiting or uh, eliminating already achieved uh, uh, rights. So uh, trends of regression, uh, trends of stagnation have been uh, on agenda. For example, uh, can anybody of you mention uh, something about impacts of neoliberal uh, globalization uh, related to the period of the last 50 years, let's say from 1970s to, to nowadays. So uh, neoliberal globalization on, on the, uh, uh, made the global pyramid of uh, inequalities and uh, so different nations and regions 
uh, have been structured in that pyramid different, differently from the top uh, and uh, going down to that wider uh, rel realm of uh, inequalities, impoverishment, etc., etc. Then within that within that uh, global pyramid, we have different countries and uh, there are different status uh, in that hierarchy. But in each of countries, uh, uh, the, the neoliberal globalization contributed to uh, the impoverishment of masses and uh, of, of masses, excuse me, impoverishment of masses and uh, then uh, also contributed to uh, uh, introducing more precarious character of uh, labor uh, sphere and uh, uh, also uh, uh, introduce, introduce focus on too much of competitiveness and individual uh, achievements. And in that context, combined with uh, the patriarchal, patriarchal heredity uh, everywhere, uh, differently uh, expressed. I will talk about that a uh, just a little bit later. Uh, the inherent uh, violent uh, dimension of patriarchal family and family relations has been uh, intensified and violence uh, against uh, women, children has been uh, also uh, intensified. So. Uh, there are many books about uh, these, how to say, neoliberal globalization impacts to the uh, rising trends of vulnerability of women, rising trends of violence, rising trends of regress in gender equality uh, achievements across the world. And uh, I like to mention one of the books uh, uh, the End of Equality, uh, the author is Campbell, and she speaks about that uh, this neoliberal globalization really put into question already achieved uh, uh, women's rights. We will speak about a little bit uh, later about those uh, achievements through suffragettes and feminist movements, through all elements of uh, gender uh, emancipation. But she speaks, for example, and she mentions uh, a few countries as the extreme uh, examples of the, the rise of violence towards women. For example, she mentions India or she, uh, also China. For example, uh, when speaking about China, she, she just shortly sum up uh, the uh, socialist revolution after 1949, uh, boosting the modernization and also as one of axioms was one of uh, the indicators of modernization was uh, uh, the focus on uh, uh, including women in uh, the labor force uh, and the gender equality as index uh, in a bigger or lesser extent ex expressed. However, with the, the period of the last 30 years of neoliberal capitalism, uh, many uh, regressive uh, expressions or manifestations have been uh, happening. So labor uh, rights uh, become put into danger, precarious labor uh, has been uh, on agenda, child care, uh, state uh, uh, secured, ensured uh, uh, child care also diminished. All, all indicators of gender equality uh, go down. And then, for example, very interesting, uh, and we have colleagues from China and also from India here, uh, she uh, also speaks about the case of uh, India, where the legislation, uh, there is the huge discre discrepancy between uh, the a patriarchal, uh, specific uh, patriarchal legacy within castes and the uh, social structure of the society. And uh, 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 
giving rights to property, for example, to women in in, in the uh, le legal system. However, uh, this neoliberal globalization with the very cruel uh, and in intensified uh, violence against women has been here expressed through the extreme rise of rapes, extreme rise of using the new technologies for uh, killing uh, the fetuses if they are not uh, so sexism, uh, uh, high technology sexism uh, applied. If uh, female uh, babies are to be born, then abortions are uh, imposed. So the huge number of female babies were uh, killed in advance for these purposes to give uh, priority to male uh, children, then uh, the, huge, uh, the huge rise of violence and killing femicide uh, has been also based on uh, dowry. So uh, if, uh, so brothers want to kill uh, sisters and uh, their husbands want to kill them and do they kill them, one or the others, because of uh, keeping the dowry by the husband or keeping the property uh, by uh, her brother. So, and for example, the Central and Eastern Europe or the, the West European countries, but just to take the example of the banning of abortion in Poland, the whole campaign uh, against um, abortion uh, and restricting that in different dimensions, which uh, currently, nowadays, uh, leads or has consequences in uh, losing the life uh, among uh, young uh, pregnant women, etc., etc. So challenges in front of uh, already achieved, globally speaking, and uh, in con concrete historical context is speaking about uh, gender equality achievements and hu uh, women rights achievements have been uh, always again uh, vulnerable and under, under the threat. And generally speaking, neoliberal globalization really uh, uh, led also in the most uh, developed Western countries towards uh, the regress, a certain regress in uh, women's rights. Because of this precarity, character of work, because of the survival strategies uh, based on uh, rigid competitiveness in which uh, no m good means are uh, chosen by any man, by anybody, but also especially by men in in their struggle for uh, dominance. <coughs> With neoliberalism, we also have uh, some new type of uh, colonization and creating a whole uh, global uh, homogenic uh, culture, meaning there is no place for pl pluralism. Okay. Uh, speaking, when speak, uh, Larissa. I just wanted to, to um, reflect on the this question, the trends of regression. Why? Uh, I would. Um, move perspective toward uh, actually people who lose their privileges. Not only people, but institutions. So it's generally the question of the loss of privileges, which, which, which lies in the, in the very root of this constant regression. For instance, throughout history, and now times across different cultures, a typical male privilege was free and unrestrained access to female body it's very difficult to renounce this privilege, even nowadays. And uh, nowadays, uh, gender-based violence yes. uh, directly related, linked to this uh, patriarchal framework of female, uh, male bodies and interrelation has been the main, uh, main cause of and violence. Yes, and I'm only speaking, I'm even speaking about education of male boys in the school. We're not speaking about violence, but they still have perception 
that they have free access to female bodies, which is really problematic. Okay, uh, thank you for, for this uh, uh, last uh, remark. My question for all of us uh, is, why overcoming patriarchal social roles would be beneficial for both, not only for female, but also for male, for boys, not only for girls? I forgot your name, I apologize, Marco. Uh, well, for boys, uh, it's also difficult to uh, be in that society as a, as a patriarchy because they are expected to behave in a certain way, which is more uh, difficult for them to adapt. For example, if uh, you said, say to a young boy, don't cry, don't be, be strong, be like that, be like that, and also we cannot uh, exclude emotions from young boys, so it's very important, important for them also to feel, uh, to not be determined in a priori these expectations of them. What would be civilizational benefits from overcoming these uh, imperatives? What would be benefits for uh, male? persons and what would be civilizational benefits and why patriarchal dividend and what it means if can if somebody can say why patriarchal dividend uh, which gives some how to say uh, benefits uh, privileges to men uh, to male uh, within these gender uh, relations also have for them negative uh, impacts and burdens Well, when we talk about Sophia, Sophia. Yeah, Sophia. sorry, Sophia. Yes. Yeah, so when we talk about the patriarchal regime and the whole expectations that it places on both women and men, we see that every man that does not fall into the typical stereotype of a man is, uh, shall we say, uh, has further difficulties to succeed in this world. So they are forced to conform to the stereotypes even if they do not want to, and in that sense, patriarchy harms them as well. Okay, uh, Mina? Similar to what has already been said, but generally any type of inequality, especially gender inequality, negatively affects any social and economic growth in, in society. So that is also something we should take into account. And just in relation to what the colleagues have mentioned, men also, in terms of gender inequality, face many stereotypes precisely in employment, not only in employment, but just, just to also mention that sphere. Like in terms of many doing many jobs which are considered not to be male and just facing stereotypes in this regard, not to speak about parental leave and other other rights. So just a quick, quick remark in this regard. Okay, what uh, from the point of the quality of life of each individual and then the quality of life within uh, the partnership or these embellished uh, gender relations within family uh, and marriage or partnerships in, in any case. So uh, what would be or what are uh, the benefits of overcoming gender inequalities? And on the other hand, uh, why uh, men we mentioned uh, brothers and uh, husbands in Indian families who commit uh, femicide because of keeping their uh, patriarchal dividend, dowry, uh, property, etc., etc. Uh, why still, for each male in each context, uh, civilizationally speaking, would be beneficial to overcome? how to say, giving priority to, to this patriarchal dividend. What do you mean, think? So the price of having uh, male uh, privileges compared with uh, the benefits of some different quality of life can 
some of your command that, Larissa? Well, it also affects the mental health of each individual. Uh, the, uh, this uh, hegemonic masculinity is only one, and what they say is uh, absolutely uh, th that stands that uh, there are many masculinities, many femininities in this world. Uh, they are also uh, people who don't fall into these categories. And basically, uh, if the children are restrained from the early beginning of their lives, it, re it affects their mental health in a serious way. And there are huge studies in psychology about this. So from the, from the very infant stage, and even prenatal stage, everything is now under scrutiny from, from this, uh, this per perspective. So it will decrease violence. Um, how would they say in, um, in one sentence, uh, provide this kind of, how should I say, overall, uh, not happiness, but uh, happy and stable people will uh, produce uh, more, how should I say, uh, productive societies in any way, not only economic, but productive in all kinds of capital that we can think of. Excellent. Uh, something else? No? Ivana Nikolic wants, uh, she raised uh, her hand. Ivana? Thank you, Professor. Uh, well, I want to agree with my colleague about mental health because there is a suicide rate that is getting rising for men. Uh, typically, I think that uh, if this were to happen, if they were to give up this patriarchal uh, dividends, that a man would be able to better connect with others. Mm -hmm. Uh, with their family, with their partners, and also with their children. Because as we know, the stereotype of a distant father who doesn't take care of their kids, who is never there, is also very present in society, uh, as well as uh, I think uh, that uh, if they were not so career focused, they might have more time for themselves to be able to think about their own issues and problems. <laughs> and that's it, thank you. But uh, you spoke about only male f uh, too big focus on career. But what about if both uh, gender in the partnership uh, want and attempt towards high quality career, but also again the quality of interrelations uh, can be understood in a specific way, how? Uh, yes, uh, I talked about that because I think that if there was a more equal divide between a career and uh, I guess the work and also like home balance, that there might not be so many stresses. So the mental health might be better and the relationship might be better. And also I guess raising children and everything. So uh, women can have also more time to devote to their career and to focus on it because the man would be like, wouldn't have so much thought put into that. So. Th uh, thank you. How is that uh, directly connected with uh, uh, the paradigm uh, work-life uh, balance? You can say or well, so somebody else. Oh, okay. Nemanja. Well, the biggest achievement would be uh, for both uh, sexes a uh, uh, chance uh, for uh, equal opportunities in, in any type of, uh, of labor, labor law, meaning um, uh, all the patriarchal uh, stereotypes would uh, pre uh, prevent uh, female uh, workers uh, to do exactly the same job uh, as uh, men would do and uh, with exactly the same quality. Okay, let's go now. So the, the, the main uh, focus is on uh, e explaining, elaborating the gender lens or uh, this gender perspective, feminist perspective, the main premises of this perspective. Uh, I will start from uh, something what we have already mentioned 
patriarchy and emancipation. And uh, I will insist on uh, the crucial importance of understanding, taking into account, uh, taking into consideration the dialectic uh, between uh, patriarchy and emancipation in all, in all uh, considerations, in theory, in uh, everyday life, in uh, political uh, practice, etc., etc., policy making practice, this dialectic. So, gender lenses should be uh, based on understanding the meaning and consequences of patriarchy, but much more important nowadays on uh, understanding this dialectic uh, between uh, patriarchy and emancipation. Uh, so I will uh, tr try shortly to elaborate this. So patriarchy uh, has been dominant uh, since uh, the ancient times through the whole uh, pre-modern uh, times uh, in all uh, societies. With, we, we, we already mentioned the, that subordination, uh, dichotomy of private and uh, public sphere, uh, violence inherited, uh, subordination of, the, of women and also of children uh, in relation with parents, etc., etc. Uh, Emanci emancipatory processes started, started with uh, modernity, with modern societies, and especially with industrial revolution, and even more especially uh, with uh, uh, political revolutions. And the combination of these uh, political revolutions and introducing uh, gradually the equal right to vote together with industrial revolution which enabled entering of women into the my, uh, to the uh, this ma mass uh, pr production because uh, the need for uh, new labor force enabled uh, women to enter uh, the factories so these uh, political revolutions and industrial revolution in 17th, 18th, 19th century uh, uh, represented the most important factors of uh, opening the window of opportunity for women to enter the public space and to uh, start gradually uh, achieving elements of uh, gender equality. So uh, somebody, I think Professor Tanasie mentioned uh, American Revolution, the French Revolution, the, the, the American, the French Revolution, and Declaration of Independence, and the uh, Declaration on uh, Equality of Men and the Citizen, uh, and also he uh, implied or uh, also mentioned invisibility of women uh, in these declarations. So uh, the notion of equal rights. Uh, of men and citizen uh, was uh, mostly uh, related to men, male to male citizens. Uh, female citizens were not vi uh, vivid, visible and vivid in these uh, ideas about uh, equality and equal right to vote. Uh, however, uh, women re recognized themselves. They they saw themselves. They uh, they uh, recognized themselves as. Uh, the individuals to whom also these uh, notions uh, on equality were related to. However, uh, uh, Olympia de Gouges was mentioned by Professor Tanasie, who demonstrated this uh, need and uh, insights and uh, provo pro provoking and provocative uh, ideas of women who wanted to show that they should uh, have been visible in these notions of uh, universal equality. And then she transformed uh, the constitution of 1791 into, uh, and declaration where was uh, written men and meant male, she uh, uh, switched and turned that into um, female. However, uh, the, for example, the, the uh, French revolutionaries, the uh, revolutionaries, uh, 
male, uh, Jacobins, they did not want to recognize all the attempts of women uh, for being equally recognized in these universal notions of, uh, uh, of equality. And for example, Olympia de Gouges lost her life because of these revolutionary female ideas. So uh, under notions of equal rights of all individuals, of all humans, of human, of human beings, primarily were meant men, and uh, women had to struggle for their equality. So suffragette movement in the United uh, in uh, America and uh, Great Britain was very strong. And uh, somebody, I think that Professor Miodrag mentioned, or somebody else mentioned the role of the First and Second World War, or Tanasie, in uh, uh, overcoming this invisibility of uh, female persons within these notions of equal rights to vote and equality among uh, human dignity, uh, equality of all human persons. Uh, patriotic uh, acting of women in the First World War ha uh, helped to softening uh, the public in uh, the United States and in the Great Britain towards uh, the attempts of the suffragette movements and helped to, uh, after a huge and very uh, a uh, strong struggle, a tough struggle of women to be acknowledged, uh, that their rights be acknowledged and recognized in 1920, 1928 uh, fully in the Great Britain and 1918 and 20 in the USA. And the Second World War uh, helped also uh, that much more across uh, the Western world and uh, uh, even wider, the equal right to vote uh, to women be uh, recognized. So from 1944, 46, uh, Switzerland, uh, in France, and uh, for example, in uh, the f former, the first Yugoslavia, but in Switzerland, it was uh, mentioned only in 1970s, this equal right to vote uh, was uh, acknowledged. So. Uh, with these revolutions and with political emancipation, with uh, industrial revolution, which gave an opportunity to many uh, women workers to take part in uh, uh, the, the factory uh, work, it, it was under very uh, se severely uh, cr cruel uh, conditions, but anyway, a little bit, so steps forwards, gradual steps for forwards, towards achieving uh, economic in independence of women was uh, enabled with these indu industrial revolutions. And uh, then after the Second World War, uh, the, the whole civilizational tra trend of mass education, etc., etc. So gradually elements uh, within economic sphere, political sphere, uh, cultural sphere, sphere, educational sphere, uh, gave uh, free space, new horizons for women to achieve uh, elements of emancipation. And that means that the, the modernity, uh, the first time in uh, the history of humankind, the modernity brought this dialectic of uh, patriarchy and emancipation uh, as the dominant framework for understanding, for for the quality of the life of women in globally and uh, uh, individually as well, and for uh, also for uh, the mindsets for understanding uh, the conditions of life of women and uh, gender relations. So modernity uh, represents the first epoch and uh, uh, contemporaneity especially so the, the, the 20th century, 21st century, have been uh, the, the centuries of the gradual ad advancement of uh, emancipation and of this dialectic of patriarchy and emancipation being on agenda. So for 
considering gender issues nowadays, in theory, in practice, uh, in different fields of uh, uh, everyday life, of private life, of public life, in different uh, fields of education, it's very important to have in mind this dialectic. So means that always again, not to speak either uh, only about ele elements of patriarchy or only about elements of emancipation because none of these poles represent the truth of, of uh, the contemporary society. This dialectic of patriarchy and emancipation characterize the lives of each us uh, as individuals uh, within different nations, regions, and globally speaking. The neoliberal uh, globalization and the mentioned pyramid is the additional, how to say, framework for understanding this dialectic of, pa dialectic of patriarchy and emancipation, globally speaking. But as I say, uh, in uh, uh, the knowledge production, in uh, understanding the quality of family life, uh, in understanding generally quality of, of the private sphere, of public, different uh, dimensions of the public sphere, their understanding and the reconsidering from this dialectic of patriarchy and emancipation is crucial. Can you, can you say why? Why it is not enough to think only from the point of uh, patriarchy and why it is not enough to, to, cons to, to consider reality uh, only from uh, the perspective of, of emancipation? Why these controversial tendencies, uh, uh, cr mutually crossing civilizational contradictory uh, tendencies have to be always again taken into, into consideration? Why in the, the contemporary times we cannot ever speak only about patriarchy? So it can be very dominant, especially in the most authoritarian, in the most uh, impoverished, uh, in the most, uh, mo most exposed to wars and different crises uh, regions uh, in the world, in the most uh, exposed to illiteracy, uh, un or, uh, lack of or urbanization, globally speaking, and uh, also when globally speaking in those uh, most poor and impoverished uh, parts, uh, wide parts of this global pyramid. But why also there, uh, we, we, we cannot, we can say that there uh, this authoritarian, uh, pa patriarchal uh, dimension of the dialectic is most uh, or more, much more, uncomparably more expressed. But still, this dialectic of emancipation and patriarchy, why is that, how to say, the global context understanding gender relations nowadays from the point of reality and also as relevant for theoretical me methodological approach? Just as you said, uh, it's this dialectic is reality of this society. So we cannot rewind our time and go back. Emancipation is already happening for more than one century. That's the first thing. The second thing is we can draw parallels, but we cannot, you know, discredit Darwin's theory from the 18th century. It has already be begun. Some people can discredit it, some religious communities, but it's it. As all other um, discoveries in uh, natural sciences or whatever, some things have already uh, unrolled, we know them, and they're reality of our society. Emancipation is not something that is a product of some whims. It's a product of, uh, uh, of huge efforts of all people, not only lay people, but people from all 
sciences that are working hardly to prove the, the, the foundations of patriarchy, to prove and to show social, anthropological, religious, cultural premises and aspects of this, and to show this, the, the social construction of, of this patriarchy, that it's not, they, so it's a fight against essentialism, it's not naturalized, and because of that, uh, that is why it's, it's, it, it is impossible to, to discredit it and to be blind to it, because it's our reality. And in the same vein, people who are uh, fully, how should I say, fully emancipated or in that discourse also need constantly to have in account that patriarchy is still dominant and to be aware of the potential regressions that might happen in every society, in, even in Finland, everywhere in the world. So we constantly need this, to be aware of this dialectic. So to continue uh, your uh, very well articulated ideas with the question, is there any individual among us, and globally speaking, in any society, in the most developed uh, societies and countries, among most educated uh, women and their partners, uh, is, is there any of those uh, who for whom we can say that they are fully emancipated? Or are there, on the other side, uh, those for whom nowadays we can say that they are uh, fully all and only patriarchal? So how this uh, dialectic has been expressed in our individual li uh, lives and in different countries? So the point, we, we, I will come back to this question and some of you may, might want to uh, make comments or uh, give their opinions. But theoretical methodological premise is that this dialect, one, for one first, is that this dialectic of patriarchy and emancipation has to be the starting point and the framework of analysis and the framework of, our, of the mindsets of all those who attempt to think and act from gender perspective and with the aim to overcome gender I inequalities. So always again, thinking through this uh, paradigm, this dichotomy, this framework of two different uh, oppositional, mutually contradictory, civilizational uh, tendencies of patriarchy and emancipation. So this dialectic is first theoretical methodological premise. The second theoretical methodological premise is that this dialectic, as I said, and uh, I am uh, waiting for your uh, comments, but that this dialectic has been very differently uh, manifested in the global context, uh, in different con concrete historical contexts, in different nations, in different cl classes, in different cultural, religious groups, etc., etc. So none of them uh, should not be considered only as fully patriarchal, and there is no fully emancipated individuals or social groups or countries, etc. What what does it mean? So how? the patriarchal heredity of thousands of years being encoded into individual lives, in families, in social groups, in habits, in legal uh, regu systems, and regu uh, in, no uh, in uh, uh, habitual norms, etc., etc., uh, have been always again there, hidden or uh, in uh, incorporated into our lives, into our mindsets, into our behavior. So, please, please. Of course. So, of course, what Professor Bujarinovic is aiming to get from you is 
some examples maybe or your own personal experience on how we have both elements of the patriarchal and the emancipatory tendencies, experiences of both the old and the new ways in our lives, etc. I would just like to underline one thing that I think is also important, that we should not regard this dialectic as some sort of fight of good against evil or something along the lines. So we don't have, as some people might think we do, a terrible, disgusting, evil, old patriarchal regime that is to be replaced with an ideal, perfect, uh, emancipatory, liberal, etc., etc. Nor do we have a perfect, old, approved by centuries, wonderful, ideal patriarchal regime that is about to be toppled by the forces of evil uh, in the new tendencies. So, both such attitudes are present with some people who cling to extremes and it's it's easier to cling to extremes it's easier to say okay this is good this is evil i'll just stick to this side and i won't be wrong but actually you have to find the middle and some sort of balance not to be wrong and that's much harder and that's why the masses are easy to manipulate because it's easier to sell a narrative that goes into one extreme, whichever extreme, when speaking to masses of people. It's easier to say they are attacking our values, whichever of these sides you feel that you're uh, leaning to more. Essentially, the fact that something is traditional mm, does not necessarily mean it's good just because it's been there for a long time, nor does it necessarily mean that it's bad, that it's absolutely out of date, that it needs to be changed simply because it's old. The fact that something is traditional means that it has managed for one reason or another to withstand the test of time for some prolonged period, depending on what area we're talking about. That could be millennia, that could be centuries, that could be a few years in recent times. The fact that something is new and modern also has no implications of quality. It simply means it has recently shown up. And we have to give the traditional part some leeway due to the fact that it has some reasons to have withstood the test of time, but we also have to keep a critical eye towards uh, those reasons because they might not be good reasons. It might be just because it was simpler for the people. It might be because some dominant group, be it a gender, a class, a race, uh, people who are rich, etc., has done through a great deal of effort to keep it that way and the fact that something is new does not necessarily think it's either good or bad it means we have yet to see how it will pr be proven in practice so when talking about patriarchy and emancipation now I presume I'm speaking to the average target audience of this course just don't be a swain into the side of thinking that everything that is <coughs> traditional needs to be changed and then we'll have some sort of ideal life. Because, for example, one tendency that I notice uh, in today's trends of, let's call them liberalization, uh, broadly speaking, is an extreme focus on individuality. Yes, the, some of the old regimes had the problem of suppressing individuals in favor of a system, but going towards a society of atomized individuals that don't put any value in the whole that they belong to, be <coughs> it family, <coughs> state, etc., <coughs> uh, uh, that is also a bad thing. So any extreme is bad, and that's why you need to develop critical thinking of your own. Sorry if I over overdone it. So I have uh, also to leave uh, time uh, to Nina for uh, the, the glossary for uh, the categories uh, 
uh, feminist discourse, uh, the, the main categories of that. Uh, so dialectic of patriarchy and emancipation has to be th the first and main theoretical uh, framework and the starting point of uh, gender equality analysis. Then it is very important that this dialectic always again uh, be kept in mind as the axis, methodological axis, but always again to be applied to different contexts, to different nations, glo first globally uh, uh, taken, then in different nations, different uh, parts of this uh, global pyramid, in different classes uh, and uh, social groups, and then this dialectic uh, of patriarchy and em emancipation also has to be uh, besides and together with this concrete historical application, always again concrete historical application, it has to be intersectional. We uh, mentioned that uh, uh, concept a few times or many times. It means that Always again, with the, uh, this dialectic within uh, the global pyramid and the uh, neoliberal global globalization, also has to combine to understand gender inequalities as uh, from inside uh, and essentially interconnected with uh, discrimination and uh, uh, female subordination based on race, uh, class, uh, religious, and other uh, sexual orientations. So uh, this intersectionality uh, has a very important uh, methodological dimension, uh, which means that uh, considering each concrete historical or concrete uh, subject of analysis or matter of uh, analogies has to take into consideration how gender uh, imbalance and the uh, subordination is combined with the class position, with the social status of particular uh, women, with their uh, religious affiliations, with the, their sexual orientation, with the, their health status, etc., etc. So. There are some uh, comments, even I will, uh, I will, uh, but, okay, uh -huh, please. So this intersectionality as approach, that is uh, this third uh, theoretical methodological premise, uh, it does not mean just adding the patchwork-like adding elements to the identity of particular female individual or so groups of uh, fe female, it means something much uh, more uh, important and deep. It means reconsidering power rela relations, which are uh, uh, inherited into these different uh, dimensions of uh, discrimination of particular uh, women or, or social gr groups and op their oppressions. So uh, if some uh, social groups of women or some individual uh, females are oppressed on the basis of their, as being uh, women, on their gender, on their sexual orientation, for example, uh, being lesbian, on their color and race, uh, on, uh, so for example, being, being uh, black women, uh, then on their social status being uh, uh, very poor on their educational uh, status, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it does not mean just uh, putting everything together in in a patchwork and identify that individual as such. It means always again thinking about that uh, that uh, subject of analysis from the point of power relations, from the point how the crossing of power relations uh, uh, built in, economic, in, in economics, in politics, in uh, uh, r race context, uh, educational context, etc., etc., have been uh, 
overlapping and uh, uh, being uh, mutually combined and crossed in uh, particular situations. So dialectic of patriarchy and emancipation, uh, global context, concrete his historical analysis, intersectional approach, and uh, also what is very important in uh, the, uh, this feminist approach uh, is uh, overcoming the binary framework of analysis, also this much more inclusive approach from the point of uh, transgender and uh, non-binary persons. And then when uh, this intersectional approach in their case is uh, taken and applied, it means also uh, having in mind, for example, in uh, judicial proceedings and applying of these all pre premises of uh, theoretical method of feminist approach. So, uh, uh, meaning that um, particular concrete life experiences of some uh, lesbian person being also, for example, uh, uh, some not non white uh, race being uh, very uh, uh, poor being uh, 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 law educated, etc., etc. So all of these elements have to be taken into consideration and all those uh, mutually crossing power relations which put into uh, uh, intersectional conditions of oppression of that particular person have to be taken into consideration. So in that context, uh, the, the theoretical, one of the premises of uh, feminist approach, besides all of these men mentioned, is so how to take into consideration the particular ex experience of the person like this, which I mentioned, uh, in uh, some uh, in in some concrete uh, judicial proceedings, storytelling, combining. Uh, rational argumentation based on the interpretation of legal norms, of the legal system, of the rights of uh, individuals, of female rights, with uh, what, with listening to uh, the, 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 and taking into consideration the p particular experiences of that particular person, so storytelling and uh, taking the approach uh, fr from the side of the victim. So the feminist critical legal thought and political thought, but especially legal thought, insists on this premise of uh, the feminist approach in, for example, in judicial proceedings, taking all of these elements which I mentioned uh, before uh, related to gender mainstreaming, to gender awareness raising, to dialectic of patriarchy and emancipation, understood and applied in this intersectional approach, and also from the point of diversity, we taking into consideration in a tolerant and open-minded way uh, non-binary uh, persons and, and their personal experiences. So this storytelling and uh, listening to how different these axes and uh, elements of gender inequality have been expressed th through particular exper experiences of those who have been uh, 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 who have been there in some particular judicial uh, proceedings as witnesses or those convicted, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Just to see, no chat, just. I would like to recommend the book Invisible Women, Exposing da Data Bias in a World Designed for Men. I have that book and I promise to uh, scan it and to upload at our Moodle. How things we take for granted influence women, for example, lights and guards at the bus stops, number of public toilets, pedestrian roads. Uh, she is she is mentioning some of the examples. Really, this book, the whole book, uh, is focused on making visible some many many details from our everyday life, where uh, this gender perspective 
and invisibility of gender equality has been uh, demonstrated. So I will uh, scan that book and I will put it. You can't upload because of copyright. We can put an excerpt and the link to where they can buy it, etc. And if someone doesn't care about copyright, they probably know where to find it. Yes, you're right. And that was the reason that we did not upload all these books from our book series, but only this one, Gender Competent Legal Education, which uh, has been uh, defined as the open access book. So you are right. But maybe I can uh, scan some more paradigmatic uh, parts of that book as with, as, and in the way how we did with uploading some relevant articles for these uh, books, uh, we, we made them, uh, we disabled their uh, downloading and uh, printing as far as our IT uh, promised and explained to me. Emancipation is an ongoing process and it does exist, but patriarchy also persists, transforming and evolving with, the, with time. Danger of patriarchy is always uh, there. Sehriban uh, Imrak from Lucia Jurlin. Can you add me to your Moodle? Uh, yes, Lucia, we will add. I don't know how it happened. Maybe you registered later or maybe uh, when our IT uh, did, uh, did apply uh, registrations also for Moodle. Ma maybe he forgot you. I will remind him. So our colleague, uh, Seh Riban Imrak, uh, is definitely right. So when I speak about uh, patriarchy and emancipation as the framework of our analysis. When we mentioned at, at the beginning challenges, uh, and uh, I uh, uh, also made focus on the short history of uh, women's rights and vulnerability of, of, of already uh, achieved uh, female rights. And when I mentioned challenges and just a few examples related to the neoliberal globalization, I, re uh, I did what uh, the colleague is talking about, uh, that uh, I did, so my point was that really patriarchy uh, has been very strong and persistent and transforming and evolving with time. So in the feminist literature, there, is, uh, there are uh, notions about um, patriarchy and new patriarchy and uh, neo neoliberalism uh, so the theory says and uh, it demonstrates where uh, in different elements of uh, the, the practice of neoliberal societies globally speaking and in each concrete historical context this ne new patriarchy has been how to say following and Continue, continuing this civilizational trend of persistence of patriarchy, new form of patriarchy uh, based on, uh, for example, on uh, elements of neoliberal strategy of development with, vulner, uh, with uh, precarious work, with uh, part-time jobs, with uh, easier losing jobs by women, with competitiveness which puts women who, who, who have very often been in the position of imbalance between uh, private and public uh, sphere, uh, between their uh, obligations uh, regarding care for uh, the home, uh, homework, uh, and for children, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of that uh, put them into again to the new forms of uh, repatriarchalization. Uh, and retraditionalization, tradi 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 and these, uh, uh, again, also the re-clericalization, and uh, these all mean uh, new forms of uh, patriarchy, so, which speaks about the deep embeddedness of patriarchy generally in the human history, and even in the contemporary times where we speak about many elements of emancipation in education, in uh, the field of work, in the field of politics, political uh, uh, and civil rights, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, still these elements of patriarchy, of the old patriarchy, 
uh, and of the new uh, manifestations of, of patriarchy have been uh, existent, persistent, and uh, reproduced. So uh, thank you for your comment, Imrak. Some. Okay, so uh, I took uh, too much time, uh, but I think that the main points uh, have been uh, presented of this theoretical methodological approach. So always again, dialectic of uh, emancipation and patriarchy uh, uh, applied at the global level, globally, in the global pyramid, applied in each individual case, applied uh, on each social group, applied in all spheres of uh, the private life, so family life, but also in uh, meaning in, uh, the uh, in the field of upbringing, uh, education of children, uh, social roles within family, uh, everyday life, etc., etc., and also in all other spheres uh, of uh, public life. And the uh, active approach, policy making approach, uh, the, the approach in lawmaking. I will skip that, and you will find that in PowerPoint, uh, which I will upload today. So, there are also the guidelines done by one particular uh, parliamentarian uh, from Finland who has become uh, the member of the European Commission, and then she made uh, the guidelines for how the parliamentarians to consider uh, gender equality approach uh, when uh, taking part in lawmaking and when taking part in the control of uh, implementation of laws. So the right questions they have, which they have to put is how the particular uh, law uh, which is to be adopted would affect uh, gender equality and uh, the life conditions of women and uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. so you will find that uh, now we have to stop and if you have some additional comments and then the glossary will be considered the main categories uh, by Nina so some comments So now, Professor Nina Kršljanin will uh, discuss uh, with you the cate categorical apparatus, so the main uh, categories, concepts, and their understanding conceptions of the most relevant uh, concepts uh, in regards of this gender issue domain. Thank you. So hello everyone from me as well. Sorry that this part will be somewhat shorter than planned, but in fact I think it won't matter much because lots of these questions have already been addressed by various speakers in the school, so I will just give you a quick run through some of the most relevant ones and you'll have the whole PowerPoint uh, on Moodle as well. Now, disclaimer, I did not make this PowerPoint. I only added the first slide, which you will see now. Uh, colleague Milena Djordjevic was also supposed to be here with us, but unfortunately she is unable to attend today. I am not a fan of PowerPoints with loads and loads of text, so you don't have to read everything in detail now since we'll be working quickly, but it will be all available to you. So this is the only slide that I felt I needed to add as the first in the presentation, although I know this difference, of course, has been mentioned several times um, during the previous courses, but I think it's important to underline because what we see today, particularly in some fields, is the use of the word gender as the new, more modern replacement for the word sex. In English, both words have been used interchangeably without a big difference since the Middle Ages, specifically when people 
wanted very much to be understood as not meaning sexual intercourse, but the sex of a person, they tried to use gender, etc. But it was only in the mid 20th century that we got gender as a social category. So gender as meaning uh, the social expectations, the social position that a given society puts on men and women as beings of opposite sexes. Now, the quotes that I have given here are from an article by Rhoda Kessler Unger. She's a psychologist. She's not a lawyer, uh, but they give some uh, examples on how to differentiate those two terms, but also why is it important to still use both. So nowadays, uh, while you can find a lot of literature in this same vein on the internet, you can also find scholarly literature that uses gender when one should really use sex, when they mean biology. They speak of gender differences in the biological sense. You have medical papers by practicing doctors speaking of gender of their patients, etc. So let's not please make that confusion. Both terms are still relevant and appropriate. Now, in some languages, what was the grammatical equivalent of gender is being used in this way. That's the case in Serbian, where we have rod, which was previously just a grammatical notion. Uh, in some languages, gender was directly uh, taken. I know in Russian they speak of gender, although uh, they have a rod also in the grammatical sense. Mm -hmm. So don't shy of saying that someone is of the male or female sex if you're speaking about their biology. <clears throat> now we'll just run through a few key issues. So here we've put it in slash. Now it's fashionable to talk about the gender equality. A few decades ago, it was equality of sexes. Again, in most cases, it might mean the same thing, but the gender word underlines that a lot of this uh, is a social construct. And of course, you can apply this and you should apply it intersectionally, as Professor has said. So we could just replace gender with some other notion here and you can apply it to any other type of equality. You can talk about races, you can talk about classes, anything that makes people socially unequal or unequal before the law, you can have their equality, their de jure, on paper, everything is equal, everyone has equal access, there is no longer any clause that says women cannot become attorneys, for example, as we heard in Boyan Spite's lecture on Monday, uh, but there might still be a very huge de facto difference between people of different groups seeking to uh, achieve the same results. And there we can see that some of the differences may really be biological and related to sex. For example, yes, biologically, on average, men are bigger and stronger than women. And so it makes sense that we have more men in the army or more men working as miners. Uh, or some other such physically strenuous activities, even where there is no legal ob uh, objection whatsoever to women uh, performing the same professions. However, uh, the same does not stand for most intellectual professions. So today, uh, attitudes such as that uh, men are naturally smarter, more socially adept, etc., are mostly a thing of the past. And where we do have uh, men having an advantage over women, uh, it's usually the result of social conditions. So the fact that, for example, in some societies, men have access to better education, or, for example, uh, that employers still prefer men to women, either because they 
think particularly for jobs in law firms at the stock exchange, etc., where they think it's good that someone is more competent, more aggressive, which are traditionally considered masculine traits, although they have nothing to do with physical strength, uh, or because, as has been mentioned in uh, various examples and will be particularly stressed on the last lecture of labor law because employers are afraid that women will go to maternity leave, etc. While today in many countries men can opt to go to paternity leave instead of their wives, we know that very few men uh, use that opportunity. And we may say again that this is biologically justifiable. Doctors tell us that it's much better for a baby to be bre breastfed by the mother than fed from a bottle, etc. The infant needs his mother in the first days. I guess, you see, I said his. It's his, hers, whatever. Uh, the baby needs the mom more when it's very little. And it's only... Uh, natural that women should take such leaves more often, but women shouldn't be penalized for taking maternity leaves, etc. You will have an interesting case today in the second workshop regarding particularly that, a woman who was demoted at work after returning from maternity leave. <clears throat> now, you have some Opinions here by Sandra Fredman, who's a British scholar who generally deals with social inequality, not just gender inequality. She has some very interesting works. Uh, so here you see some interconnected aims. Again, you can apply this to other social issues, not just gender, other cases of discrimination. Uh, so when we talk about discrimination against women, we can have direct discrimination where women are not uh, explicitly not allowed when, say, a job ad says that a man is wanted for some post, etc., or indirect discrimination where theoretically all candidates are applied, but for some of the reasons we've mentioned or some others, the employer might prefer to hire a man, etc. Now a question, can we have in the 21st century discrimination against men? Can you give me an example of discrimination against men in such a situation? Okay. I'm sorry, it was very hardly intelligible. Could you say it again? Okay, I didn't get everything again, but if I understood you correctly, you're talking about jobs of care. So, for example, taking care of people with disabilities or working in schools, kindergartens, etc. Women are more wanted for jobs like that. I'll comment afterwards. Thank you. We also have a few hands in the room. I just wanted to say it's the revenge of uh, thousand, thousand years of discrimination against women. Lots of women now have uh, plenty of anger about what, uh, hap what uh, happened during thousands of years. And I, th I think we cannot um, overpass it immediately. Okay, so we may have angry feminists discriminating against men in hypothetical retaliation for the past. Okay, Nemanja. Well, in the Republic of Serbia, uh, I can see discrimination against, uh, against men, uh, concretely uh, fathers. So uh, there is a Facebook group called uh, Justice for the Dads, and uh, there are a lot of cases where uh, they, uh, they have, uh, have been uh, discriminated uh, in uh, terms of uh, parental uh, law. Okay, thank you very much. Did you want to say something? Later. 
Okay. Uh, so, yes, we have situations like that. I like Nemanja's example. Uh, it's something stemming from initially a good idea. So, uh, the, the cases that Nemanja mentions, and it is true that courts more often award custody to mothers than to fathers, etc., uh, they don't stem from the uh, judges uh, wish to discriminate against women. They stem from their belief that it is better for a child to be with the mother than with the father in the case uh, if parents get divorced. And sometimes that may be the case. It might even more often be the case, uh, but that should not be taken for granted. And I am sure that many uh, such child custody verdicts could be revisited through a gender competent lens. Uh, and I'm not saying necessarily a feminist one, so not necessarily pro-women. Uh, so we should be careful that although, of course, even today women are discriminated against more often, uh, we can go to the other extreme and start discriminating against men. Now, also, there are some cases where um, women are favored for some reason, but that does not necessarily mean that those who favor them uh, think highly of women and lowly of men. Uh, that's for certain types of jobs. I think Professor Kostic mentioned the Chinese restaurant that was specifically looking for waitresses. So in some sectors of service, uh, you have this stereotype that uh, women are also better suited. So not talking about professional care, such as nursing little children, but for as waitresses, stewardesses on airplanes, secretaries, etc. Many employers will uh, prefer a woman uh, for reasons sometimes that they think women will be nicer to customers, sometimes for sexist reasons such as preferring to have an attractive woman there uh, instead of a man, etc. Uh, but we do see uh, a general trend in many jobs, not necessarily all, but many, that when a job is opened to women, men start specializing away from it, and it becomes a job that has lower wages, less social prestige, etc. For example, let's say in the 19th century, so even 18th in some countries, school teachers were almost dominantly men. Then the profession was gradually opened to women because they managed to advocate that women are good for working with children, etc., etc. And men started moving away from it, moving to higher education, leaving the work with primary school kids, mostly to female teachers, sometimes explaining it that they're good as mother figures and so on. And again, there can be good and valid arguments there, but there is also the fact that the prestige of the profession starts dropping. So the same goes with many of these service professions and so on. Uh, the same goes for some highly specialized professions such as the judiciary. You heard yesterday that we have around 70% women in the Serbian judiciary, that generally our law profession is mostly feminine, and some people might say it's good, and it's generally good that there is no block for women to enter the legal profession anymore. But the higher up positions, the presidents of courts, etc., are mostly men. And even uh, when you compare it to the fact that the majority of judges in general are, are women, that decreases the percentage further. So even though we have the majority of women in the judiciary. Generally, we have a majority of men on the head of the judiciary. Now, of course, 
uh, we won't necessarily have good or bad judges if they're mostly men or mostly women. This doesn't say anything about the quality of the judiciary in general. Judges can be of either sex and be very professional and very well educated or be very unprofessional, unable to think for themselves, bad law students who barely graduated in 10 years and somehow found a job in a court. So this is, of course, unrelated to someone's sex and gender, uh, but it is good to have both sides on the table, so to speak, so to have uh, both sexes present in the judiciary. And why do you think are there more men uh, heading courts in Serbia and in many other countries. Although, for example, in Serbia, most judges are women. Yes, there was a correction for what I said. Uh, uh, specifically, yes, feminist does mean pro-equality, not pro-women, though it is misunderstood as pro-women against men due to the wave of radical feminists sometimes, yes. so that's sorry. Can, can yes, I there was. Mm -hmm. so I, I, I mm -hmm. also want, wanted to uh, uh, make such a kind of uh, remark. So feminist, uh, gender competent, but not feminist, that's not a good problem. Yes, that, that, that was because, just a mistake. Uh, feminist approach, which I did not underlie enough in uh, articulating theoretical methodological premises, feminist approach means also taking into cons consideration gender equality also for male. So uh, I, I, through my questions about benefits for men and uh, for male and female implications for both uh, genders uh, were given, but this was not enough uh, accentuated. So discrimination of male uh, because of uh, being focused on gender equality in favor of female is not a part of the feminist, uh, proper feminist approach. So mutual benefit and civilizational benefits for both uh, genders and sexes and trans transgender people are uh, important in this approach. So why are men more often in higher positions in courts and other places as well? Well, for starters, because of the work-life balance that we mentioned, such positions demand more time is invested, more obligations, and women are often less likely to even apply for such positions or to be considered by those higher up. Both options are possible because it is generally socially expected that women will be the ones taking care of the children, taking care of the house, despite the fact that they are also working uh, a full-time job. Again, there's nothing wrong with a woman taking care of the house and children on her own if she wants that. There's nothing wrong with a woman not working at all and the man supporting the family if that's what the married couple agrees upon as being a model that suits them both. There is also nothing wrong with a woman working and a man taking care of the house and children and not working if that's what the couple wants. What is wrong is that society imposes, in some cases, the standard that it should be the woman staying at home and the man working, and particularly that if both work, the woman should also do all the cleaning, housekeeping, and taking children to school, while the man should not do that. And here we have a transitional moment between the industrialization that may have been good, but that also created the model of the male breadwinner initially. So the man who goes outside the house to work and to bring money to the household, because previously in the Middle Ages and the antiquity, most of uh, households' work for their survival was made at home. People tilled their own land, 
bred animals, grew food for their own use, etc., etc. Yes, of course, lots of that work was also frequently gender segregated. So men were more uh, often doing difficult jobs in the field and women taking care of children and cooking and so on and so forth. Uh, but it was all work within their common household. And then comes the industrialization and says the man should go out somewhere to a factory, to an office, and do something completely unrelated to their everyday life so he could bring money, so they could buy goods cheaper, maybe of more quality, maybe <laughs> not, than what they used to produce for themselves previously. Uh, so I industrial revolution also uh, gave, on the basis of patriarchal heredity, the brand breadwinner uh, position primarily to men. But on the other side, also pushed uh, forwards in, 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 in an em emancipatory way women because gave them also the opportunity to some of them to enter the public sphere of uh, uh, mass production, uh, because in, in industrialization needed mass production, needed more labor force. So getting at least a little bit of economic independence means the step, uh, a crucial step forwards for, we, uh, for women to take uh, em emancipation. Economic in the independence is besides equal right to vote, uh, really, and besides uh, education. Uh, really something crucial for uh, em emancipation. But to, to come back to your question about why uh, the most of uh, female judges we have and uh, the presidents of courts, and what does it, was, what does it speak about, the, uh, I would add, about the dialectic of patriarchy and emancipation. Uh, emancipatory elements of uh, mass education contributed to the mass education of women and their uh, getting an opportunity to, to become judges. But then this dialectic uh, has also its expression. Then when uh, uh, the promotion, the professional promotion comes on agenda, uh, more uh, uh, male judges get the high positions of the president's uh, uh, of the courts on this, on the basis of the patriarchal ma matrix. Maybe they are not as uh, qualified as, as some of those uh, v female judges, but then this dialectic comes and we should understand that. Yes, and again, this can go for any other factor, so mm -hmm. race, social status, yes. etc. Just imagine any uh, other sphere other than the judiciary, which is let's say, not so uh, attractive in terms of earnings, etc. But imagine uh, practicing lawyers, people at the stock exchange, imagine uh, the film industry, political parties, whatever, and imagine what various factors are at work there, although on paper everyone has equal access. Of course, you can succeed even when you come from a discriminated group, but it is much, much harder. Mm. So, uh, since we're a bit over time, uh, I won't be focusing on all of these notions on the slide. Once again, to underline that, of course, practically everyone can uh, face this discrimination on multiple accounts at the same time, uh, that uh, two people in the same situation can face discrimination on different accounts, and that's why the intersectional approach is so important. So even when you're on a course that is now devoted to one issue, that is law and gender, never underestimate the importance of class, race, religion, and all other factors that may be in the equation in a particular case. Mm -hmm. Again, violence against women, maybe direct, maybe indirect. You can see the definitions on screen. Uh, again, one has to be uh, careful to uh, see the facts of the concrete case. So just the fact that a man is the perpetrator and a woman a victim does not necessarily mean that it's gender-based violence, as we put it. So yes, if a jealous man kills his partner, that is gender-based violence. But if a, 
uh, careless driver in the street hits a female pedestrian, that has nothing to do with her gender. So uh, these are, of course, cliche examples. But again, you have to know how to look at all the facts of a case. There's no clear-cut solution that will tell you discrimination here or do something there. You have to be a wise judge, lawyer, or whatever your profession in the future may be. Uh, again, another term that is coming um, to focus lately is the feminization of poverty, particularly after the COVID crisis, so that many of those who lost their jobs uh, during the pandemic, many more were women than men. Again, that may be a conscious decision on the part of a family that since they can't both keep their jobs, it's better for the woman to stay at home with children, etc. But in many cases, it is not. And particularly, again, giving their childcare duties, women are more often working part time, uh, working at the jobs where they don't have a proper employment contract, and uh, women were more often working in service industries that were particularly hit by the pandemic, etc., etc. Uh, these were the issues that you already mentioned in some other courses, so we won't uh, spend time on them now. You will have this uh, presentation, and as for the judiciary, you will have the second workshop now and a very interesting case to uh, consult. So I thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Just keep them brief because we're running a little bit late. So if there are no questions, thank you very much. We'll take a short break so you can grab a coffee or something, and then we'll continue. Ten minutes. Uh, Fifteen. Like Fifteen. Okay. Uh, okay. Fifteen minute 15 break. Is Those who are here can take coffee. Those who are online, take care of yourselves, and we'll see you in 15 minutes in the second workshop.